Welcome to PowerCode Music. In this presentation, we're going to talk about home studio speaker specifications, everybody's favorite topic, and simply explain some of the more difficult ones. Many people struggle to understand certain loudspeaker specifications, especially when shopping for a new pair for their home studio. The impact of this is that if they don't understand how sound is tested and measured for a set of speakers, then how would they know if it's even a decent product to begin with? If it's a good product for their specific home studio environment? Or if it's the best choice for the type of music that they produce? When it comes to analyzing and shopping for speakers, many folks listen to how speakers sound in a retail environment or over the internet, you know, in a video. They may also take another's recommendation as to how a speaker sounds, and this can be good or bad depending upon the circumstances. Rarely are buyers able to listen to how a loudspeaker sound in their own home studio environments. That is before they make a purchase. Now, naturally, this is one of the more ideal ways to make this type of decision, but it's not the norm for most people, and it can be difficult to pull off. In this presentation, I'm going to try to explain in simple terms what some of the more confusing specifications actually mean and how they're derived. We'll also look at how to recognize variations between sound measurement processes. So let's get started. There are two popular specifications that many pay the most attention to right out of the gate. Those being frequency response and power handling. While frequency response and power handling are essential, don't get me wrong, there are some scenarios where specifications like directivity index or DI or Q are primaries. Let's start with the frequency response specifications. The definition of frequency response is the dependence on signal frequency of the output-input ratio of an amplifier or other device. In this case, frequency refers to the rate at which a vibration occurs that constitutes a wave, either in sound waves or in radio waves and light, and is usually measured per second. The plus and minus tolerance at the end of a rating which is expressed in decibels, is critical to understand. This is because the plus and minus tolerance indicates the loudspeaker should not have more than a variance of that assigned value. That is in the levels in between the listed frequency response range of a unit. Now here's a point of note. If the unit specifications do not have the plus and the minus tolerance at the end of the rating, then the frequency response numbers are worthless because the variation level is unknown. Some companies list the minus 10 decibel or low frequency down point. Now this is regarded as the loudspeaker's functioning frequency range. Many brands suggest using a high pass filter on their speaker's low frequency to safeguard against overexertion. A frequency response that is capable of producing sound in the audible range of 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz is considered good. <laughs> this means that a unit operating within this range will produce all frequencies in the audible range of human hearing. So the closer to this range, the better. No use in producing sound that we just can't hear. <laughs> we'll move on to the power handling specifications. A peak power specification listing is four times the speaker long-term power handling spec. A short-term specification listing is at least 25% higher than the long-term power handling spec. Long-term power handling can also be shown as continuous power handling. The EIA-426 and the AES standards are the main measurement systems used to calculate loudspeaker power handling. 
the EIA-426 consists of two test types. The first is the EIA-426A. This test uses white noise filtered with a 6 decibel octave high pass filter at 40 hertz and a 6 decibel low pass filter at 318 hertz. This is an 8 hour test on the speaker with a 6 decibel crest factor. The second test is the EIA-426B. Now this test is different because it uses pink noise and has a flat response from 50 hertz to 2 kilohertz. Above 2 kilohertz, the response rolls off at a 3 decibel octave. There are also brick wall filters at 50 hertz and at 10 kilohertz. This is also an 8 hour test on the speaker with a 6 decibel crest factor. Now a brick wall filter is an electronic filter with full transmission in the pass band, complete attenuation in the top band, and abrupt transitions. Let's move on to the AES test. This test also uses pink noise filtered with a 12 decibel octave Butterworth filter both high and low, one decade apart. A Butterworth filter is used for image smoothing in the frequency domain. Now it removes high frequency noise from a digital image and preserves low frequency components. A decade is a 10 to 1 frequency ratio. For example, 200 hertz to 2 kilohertz is a decade. A or should I say the decade used will be specific to the device being tested. Now this is a two hour test with a crest factor of six decibels. This means there will be peaks in the signal of up to four times the continuous signal level. Let's move on and talk about the sensitivity specification. In simple terms, sensitivity is a speaker's ability to convert power into actual sound. It's basically how much power you need to make your speaker function properly. Usually this is shown as one watt, one meter, measured directly on access with the speaker. The one watt power comes from 2.83 volts applied to an eight ohm load. The higher the sensitivity rating, the louder the speaker will be. The average speaker comes with a sensitivity of around 87 decibels to 88 decibels. A speaker with a sensitivity range of 90 decibels or higher is considered excellent. Now keep in mind that the harder you drive your speaker, the more power you use and the more distortion is generated. A high sensitivity speaker though will use much less power which will also cause less distortion, leading to overall better sound quality. Now let's move on and look at the Directivity Index, or DI, specification. For loudspeakers, the DI is the gain of a loudspeaker at a stated angle. It is the Q <laughs> converted into decibels. This is the gain of the loudspeaker due to directivity. If the DI is lowered, the pattern radiation becomes increasingly omnidirectional. Now it's important to understand that frequency wavelength versus driver loading defines the way a speaker manipulates sound directivity. For example, a big horn in an arena can control directivity at lower frequencies better than a basic cabinet that's front loaded. This is due to how big it is and the enclosure driver configuration. The effect known as beaming <laughs> occurs when woofers that are front loaded begin to show a higher cue when the frequency wavelength arrives and then becomes smaller than the Wolfer cone's diameter. Let's move on to the Q specification. Q stands for quality factor. In regards to loudspeakers, 
this represents a number that defines how a woofer resonates within an enclosure. Woofers have their own resonating frequency that relates to sound pressure when they are mounted in a box. Now, woofers interact with the air enclosed within that space, right? Makes sense. Now with this, a low Q will have a wider coverage area and a high Q unit will have a more narrow coverage area. High Q units are generally used in areas with a lot of echo when you need to keep sound focused on a listening area and off the reflective surfaces of the room. Let's move on to the impedance specification. Impedance is measured in ohms, which is the derived international system expression unit of electrical resistance. It affects a speaker's load on an amplifier. This is an important spec when matching speakers to amplifiers. Impedance is frequency dependent. This means that impedance is more than the electrical resistance measured by using an ohm meter at the input terminals of a speaker. Driver loading affects impedance. For a single driver, Impedance is the sum of DC resistance, voice coil inductance, and motional impedance. Now, motional impedance includes inductance, resistance, and capacitance from the driver in motion. Woofers work the same way. For instance, a horn-loaded woofer will have a different impedance measurement than a front-loaded woofer. Now keep in mind that a speaker's impedance rating is its average impedance. This means that the impedance curve will have peaks and valleys. With this, use caution when hooking multiple speakers to a single amp channel. The lower the impedance, the more efficiently it allows the electric signal, which is the music, to pass through the loudspeaker. For most folks, 6 ohm or 8 ohm speaker spec or a 6 ohm or 8 ohm speaker spec is considered normal. Well that's a wrap. If you like this presentation give it the thumbs up and click the subscribe button on your screen now to join our group. We have new presentations coming out every 7 to 14 days and we would love to have you be a part of our team. Also leave a comment in the comment section and let us know what you think about this video and check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Spotify. Also, while you're here, check out some of the other videos, listen to the music, let us know what you think about that too. Also, check out the playlist because they're designed just for you. Thank you so much for stopping by. We really appreciate it and we look forward to seeing you soon.